Hello and welcome to Brick System Brothers. I'm Nathan Masters and I have a presentation for you guys today. Uh, I've worked a little bit harder on putting this stuff together than some of our other videos because this is something I uh, kind of have a passion for and I find it really interesting. So I wanted to share that with you guys today in this video about Rare Lego. And um, there, there is kind of some confusion um, in the community about what exactly counts as Rare Lego. So I do want to address that here and then I want to just look at a bunch of examples of, uh, you know, what makes Lego rare? Um, is it pieces in sets that are hard to find? Is it pieces that Lego produced in the factory that aren't supposed to be out? Um, and yeah, we're going to look at both of those and some other things as well. So uh, I'm calling this What Do You Mean Rare Lego? Because it really does mean, it really does matter like what you're talking about in terms of um, was it something that was produced for the customer or was it something in-house? So that's where we have to start. Um, we have to start with what is rare. And when we ask what is rare, we see there's kind of three things to ask about that, specifically with Lego, um, and that is how many examples exist. So quantity, how old is it, um, going to the age side of things, and then who has it. So if there's like two examples in the world and it's really old and one person has both examples compared to you know maybe two different people having both examples and maybe that's slightly different rarity I don't, I don't know it's hard to classify sometimes um, but just these three things kind of keep that in mind as we go through and that does kind of all factor into what makes Lego rare so where I want to start with the discussion is kind of the two main camps that Rare Lego falls into, and in my opinion, and this is production versus prototype. So we have kind of two different levels of Rare, and these are both active categories. So this is kind of an ongoing um, system that I have in my head. And there are a couple outliers, and I'll address those at the end of the presentation, but production versus prototype rarity would be like this set here, 10123 is a production set. Uh, it included this printed Bubba Fett minifigure, and for its time that was pretty high quality, and um, it's now a very desirable figure worth hundreds of dollars. Uh, versus our prototype, this red Bubba minifigure over here, really the only um, prototype piece is the red helmet because that was not actually put into production. Um, the rest of the minifigure, you can find those parts in red, in various sets, but the helmet you cannot because it was uh, a factory in-house production. So yeah, production versus prototype rare. Um, we're going to start on the production side and we're going to look at a couple sets. So when people say that they have a rare Lego set, I think um, specifically with like these kind of sets, it's rare in the sense that they're hard to find. And you see, I see this the most in like eBay listings where they'll just have the set number and then probably to help drive traffic to their listing, they say, yeah, it's rare. Um, and I think that that's, that's fair, uh, but we have to keep in mind that these were produced for the marketplace and they were produced in quantity. So it's not necessarily something that it was like um, limited in the sense that there's like, well, there's a limited number out there and they're getting increasingly harder to find, but it was still a production Lego set. So there's quite a few. Um, but these two I did want to look at. The 10123 from the previous slide is our Cloud City original 2003 set and if you have a sealed copy of these, these are worth about a thousand dollars now. So I think describing these as rare is a fair description just because the value has increased so much and they're getting harder to find. Um, the other big one that we see a lot is Cafe Corner, uh, 2007. This set kind of kicked off the modular building series. And so at the time, it was kind of the start of a new series. Lego wasn't sure if it would perform well, and so they didn't produce as many. And now, as people are buying the modular building each year, as we know, it's a very popular theme, um, a lot of collectors want to get the Cafe Corner to kind of complete the whole scene, right? So um, just... The fact that it produced in lower quantity and also produced 13 years ago now is increasing the value quite a bit and um, it, I think it classifies as a rare set. So sealed copy here, 1400 plus, and even like a used cafe corner, several hundred dollars. 
Um, if you're willing to cut some corners on pieces, you can get it down to like a couple hundred, 200 maybe. But then do you really have cafe corner? I don't think so. All right, uh, a couple other things with sets. We want to look at our older sets. And at this point, you know, these 1970s, 1980s sets, it's very hard to find a sealed copy. But the other thing that we have is uh, the older you go with Lego, the less, in general, the less sets that were produced. And so when we see these described as rare, um, I think that's just rare in the sense that fewer were produced, uh, making them harder to find in general. So our classic yellow castle, uh, very nostalgic. Um, if people know what they have, this starts at about $100. Um, but I've heard stories of people finding these at garage sales and getting these for like 10 bucks really jealous um, but it's still out there to be found so it's not um, you know it's not impossible to find these they're just becoming more valuable and then uh, our space cruiser kind of uh, epitomizes classic space so a lot of people remember this from their childhood if they had a dark age and they want to get back into Lego and start collecting the sets that they remember that they had um, a lot of people look for the classic space sets and 487, the Space Cruiser, uh, another set that starts over $100 even used. Um, and these are just hard to find sealed now because most of the copies that were bought were opened and played with. Um, just want to go back and mention kind of newer sets, you start to get into people that actually use LEGO as an investment and so they'll buy multiple copies of a larger set and then just let that sit in storage for several years and accumulate value. Um, and it's a good strategy. Most of the time Lego sets do accrue value. So if you are still looking for these sets, it's easier to find these sealed, albeit more expensive, because people now have this investment strategy. And I think back in the old days, that was, that was pretty rare to have people that just bought multiple copies of Lego sets to sit on. I think it still happened, but just at a lower rate. Okay, so that's our production rare sets. Moving forward, we want to look at production rare parts. And I think this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. Um, again, not necessarily rare in quantity because they're still produced uh, in mass, but compared to other sets and other parts, these have really low relative production. And so just two examples that I found pretty early just looking through, doing some research. This um, roof slope piece that kind of has this compound slope in light gray. It was only produced in one set in 2006 in addition to that, there was only one in that set. So that makes this a really low relative production part. Um, basically what we have is however many of this set 7785 LEGO produced, I think it was like a, a Batman Arkham Asylum, however many of those sets LEGO produced is basically how many of these roof pieces we have um, in existence now. And, you know, plus or minus a few for ones that got thrown out or if there were extra produced in the factory but it's kind of a benchmark to go off of. So that's maybe one of the more harder to find production parts and depending on how you define rare this does classify as rare in my opinion because it is low and relative to the other pieces. Um, maybe a little bit more recent here last year with the Friends, um, the Central Perk Coffee Ideas set this dark green lamp post so far has only shown up in that set um, and it included three. But we have to be careful now because this was only a year ago and um, we could see Lego use this piece again in upcoming sets and models. I haven't really looked at all of our, our new summer sets this year so they might actually have this coming up this summer. Um, but you know when you look back at this light gray one from 2006 we could see it again, but it's been 14 years, so it might be, um, de it's definitely probably harder to find than something more recent. Um, and while we're looking at production rare parts, we can go ahead and look at the old production parts as well. So technically, these very first LEGO um, automatic binding bricks were production, but at that point, I mean, I think this was the 40s. The LEGO was just a little tiny company in Denmark and they were only producing for local sales. And so even compared to our one-in-one -one set uh, light gray roof slope, these production automatic binding bricks are way harder to find. 
but still out there, you know, um, flea markets. I think it's a lot more common to find these in Europe just because that's where they were produced. Um, and then we can start looking at, you know, different molds and colors. So when I say mold here, I'm referring to the actual metal um, part that LEGO uses to do their plastic injection molding. And uh, that specifically refers to the actual element type. And then that element could be available in a range of colors. Um, but then we will look at like individual colors. Uh, for example, here, this uh, Marisk blue, the 10152, has a very specific blue, shade of blue, that was only in production for a couple of years. And so some of these inverted slopes uh, were only available in a couple sets. And I looked this one up in particular on BrickLink, and this single set has 10, at least 10 unique combinations of the mold and the color. So that that's kind of another thing to look at when you're looking at production rare parts. Um, and this was more common in the early 2000s. Lego was starting to get a little uh, more, you know, beyond what they could handle in terms of uh, ramping up their production, and they were doing a lot of different colors. Um, just to kind of have a visual example of that, uh, there's a guy named Ryan Howder that's made a, kind of like a color history tracking. So he has this chart, and we'll look at this real quick. But just keep your eye on this column in the middle here um, where a lot of these colors just kind of get cut off um, between like 2004 and 2006, 2007. And that's when LEGO was really cutting back on their production. And they, they had a whole bunch of these colors that they said, all right, we're not going to do these anymore. We're going to focus on going back to some of the basic, those five main colors that have always been in production, and then a couple of variations of each of those. So yeah, from that we can see kind of where that cutoff was, and that was slowed by the late 2000s. And now we do see LEGO com companies kind of bringing that growth back, and we do see more unique combinations. We'll get to that in a little bit. So I like to use BrickLink for looking at individual parts, um, especially if you know the number. You can go ahead and type that in, and uh, this is pretty recent where we've got our new BrickLink beta site, the BrickLink XP, um, but it is functional right now. So uh, just, let's just say, let's look at this Apple. Uh, part number is 33051. And our kind of info tab for the Apple has an image and then it says known colors four. So we have this red, uh, green, bright green, and pearl gold. And these are the four colors that Lego has produced the Apple in. But we don't really know the dispersion of the colors, like uh, is red the most common or is green the most common, um, pearl gold, like I didn't even know Lego made a pearl gold apple. And so what we have to do is we have to look at this little expansion tab, uh, and this is all built into BrickLink, so it's really handy. So you click on that and then that brings up this um, detail page. And now we can see over on the right is some more information, and I want to look in particular at the sets column. And so our bright green apple is in 110 sets, and this is current as of May 2020. Um, so it's by far the most common. Uh, and then red is in 74 sets, so second place there. Then the regular green apple is in 35 sets, and it also has a range of years, so you can kind of see when these have been produced. It looks like a pretty common, about 20 year range for all of them. But then our pearl gold is only in two sets, and that was started in production 2017. Uh, I think it's in a Minecraft set. And so in this case, we have this color for the apple that is much harder to find than the other colors. And so that makes the apple, you know, rare because it is harder to find. Um, so looking at which colors and elements are new, and as these are produced, I wanna talk about new elementary. So before, you know, to kind of get into what that is, um, I have to talk about recognized LEGO fan media. And so these are the people that get sent LEGO sets in advance uh, before they go on the market to kind of review them and get uh, the public, you know, the public has access to the information about the set, but not the set itself. So Brickset is a website that is recognized LEGO fan media. 
Um, there's a bunch of YouTubers that are uh, recognized. Uh, we are not yet. Maybe someday. And New Elementary is another website that is recognized LEGO Fan Media. And so these um, websites, these YouTubers, receive a couple LEGO sets. Um, I don't think they get a copy of every single one. But what they're able to do is about a month before they go on the market, they can make their own reviews. And um, LEGO does this because it's more cost effective to just send them a set than try to get all this produced themselves. And so they send one copy to most of their LEGO fan media um, partners. And New Elementary, I'm really, I'm a big fan of the New Elementary site because of how they approach it. And so besides just reviewing the set in general, New Elementary takes this approach of looking at, well, it's in the website name, New Elements, right? And so for the Disney train, they kind of break it down and we end up with this um, summary of New Elements. It looks like there's seven. And yeah, they really they, they lay it out really clean and simple. And so in the Disney train, what are our new elements that we haven't seen before? Well, we have this blue looking tooth element, a three by three with a rounded corner and nugget, a couple of slopes and nugget, that dark red one by two with the grooves, um, a pair of black handcuffs and an unprinted brown shield. And most of the time they also look at um, pieces that aren't as common but maybe have already been in production. And so it's really handy for seeing uh, where are these new molds coming from and which sets can you find these pieces in. And recently with the Fiat 500, um, it turns out we actually have a whole bunch of new molds in this cool yellow color. And so this creator expert car set just introduces um, way more than usual in this color. And you can see they're not necessarily rare, because there's several copies of these colors, but so far they're exclusive to the set. And like I said before, especially with our recent releases, you have to be careful because it could only be a couple months before we see these same parts in other sets. But it is a good place to start if you wanna look at where are our new LEGO elements coming from. And so um, they do have a couple different approaches. The previous couple sets were just individual reviews um, but they also received, I think, the whole Speed Champions line, or even if they didn't receive it, they can go out and buy it, right? And then um, they just look at, as, as a whole, for 2020, the introductory Speed Champions sets, what is new? And so there's two new windshield molds, but they have three in here because there's one of them has two variations with the printing. Um, and so the printing one counts as two different elements. And then three different colors of the rims, the new base plate, and a couple other elements there. And so that's maybe looking at a theme instead of an individual set. Uh, and then they have old elementary articles um, that go back to 2013. And so they've been on the web for a while. Um, and it's a really interesting kind of variety of other stuff on there. But um, in terms of the new elements, this is one of the top sites in my opinion. New elementary, check that out. Okay, um, kind of a transition phase before we get to the prototype rare would be limited production rare. And so this is where we have um, production sets, but they were limited, uh, maybe specifically available in a certain region, um, but still different from prototype because they were intended for release. And so an example I have of that here is the 1237 uh, Asimo robot, which was a Japanese Honda promotional that ran for three months in 2001. So really limited, really exclusive. And on top of that, it has this white Technic pin and there was only one per set. And so, um, you know, we're kind of looking at rarest of the rare in terms of still in the production side of things. And so this white Technic 3L friction pin in white, as far as we know, has been in one set that was available for three months and it was only available in one country. So um, thanks to Hugh on Brickset for, for bringing this to my attention. He wrote an article about this and um, that article along with all of our other sources are in the last couple pages of the presentation. So check that one out. I just find that really interesting that, um, yeah, we do have this really limited production stuff. Um, and of course, if I'm talking about limited production, I have to talk about the minifigures, the collectible side, where we have 
very popular Mr. Gold, I would say is probably the most well-known collectible minifigure. And um, what makes this minifigure so special is it was limited to 5,000 in production. And they were kind of randomly placed in the series, I think it was series 10 minifigures. And those are blind bags. So you have to, you have to like know what you're looking for. Some people probably ended up with this by mistake and they have no idea what they had. I think there's still, there's like a counter somewhere and they are maybe 3000 or so confirmed Mr. Golds have been found. And so there's still like a few authentic ones out there, but at this point, uh, the rest, the secondary markets caught on and there's a bunch of knockoffs that just flooded the market. And so you have to really know what you're looking for. And I wouldn't even want to risk it. You know, how do you know you're buying an actual Mr. Gold? There's people selling the knockoff ones for a couple of dollars just because it looks like Mr. Gold. And then there's people selling uh, fake Mr. Golds for actual value of the minifigure, which is a couple hundred dollars. I don't know. Um, but that is not the most rare minifigure. The San Diego Comic-Con exclusives over here on the right, I think I've seen numbers uh, in the thousand, like about a thousand of these each. And so those are very desirable. And then kind of a random, uh, le this Lester guy who's limited to 275. And I think it's only gonna be worth something if it's still sealed in the original packaging. It was like a promotional deal. Um, and now, now we're getting back to our uh, limited production run regional as well, because this was only in London. So yeah, Mr. Gold, I would say, is pretty well known, um, and that's maybe an entry point for a lot of collectors where they're looking at, oh, well, this is, this is maybe something that's more limited. Um, it'd be cool to have one. Um, but that is definitely not the farthest you could go with limited production rare. There is something called the Inside Tour that LEGO runs. Uh, it's a yearly event with multiple groups. I don't know if it'll happen this year, but um, it's very, um, a lot of people want to take the Inside Tour and it's kind of like a lottery system where you sign up and then only a few people actually make it in. And so I think the groups run about, uh, there's maybe like 80 to a group, but then there's other smaller groups and stuff. So. As far as how many of these are actually produced, um, it's hard to give an exact number. Based on what I found, I think it's going to be between 50 and 200 of these actually produced. And it's um, usually it's a unique set, but as you can see in our 2007 and 2008, these are both production sets. What sets them apart for the inside tour is they have this unique packaging. So an example, uh, our bottom right here, the 2014 inside tour set is this train. And so what we have is the, it looks like a regular Lego box, but then in the bottom right corner is um, your, your set will be like 20 out of 80. Like I said, I think that's specific to the current tour and then they run multiple groups through. And so that's maybe where that 200 comes from. Um, and then there's also an opportunity to get your set signed by some of the um, officials in the Lego group. And so even if you have that Market Street or that Town Plan, just regular LEGO set, it isn't the official Inside Tour one because it doesn't have this other stuff. So what sets these apart is sometimes these get new molds and colors as well. Um, this Legoland train in, in particular has these dark gray handrails and there's three of these in the set. And so if you're looking at, let's say we have 200 of these that were produced, and officially released is still production because it's produced for the inside tour. That's 600 dark gray fences. Um, in in technically in the market, I don't think a lot of people would want to sell them, but they're technically in the, in the public um, sphere. So very rare Lego piece, still production though. And so I want to mention the inside tour because last year's set was uh, the Lego system house. And it has probably some of, well, probably one of the most rare Lego production elements. And that's this 3D printed slide rule piece. So this is a really specialized piece and um, it was made to, to represent the slide rules used in early Lego development um, on these drafting tables. 
and it's 3D printed as well, so it's uh, different from your traditional molding methods. There's only one per set, um, and so now again, if we if we only have 200 of these in production, then there are only 200 of these slide rule pieces in production. Um, so pretty rare. Also, with this Inside Tour 2019 set, the glass for this window frame, the 1x4x4 frame, has been a frame for a while, but it hasn't ever had a glass element. And people have noticed it's got these inserts if there, you know, if there were a piece to be produced for that. And we also have uh, a different kind of uh, cover element that's like a door that can open up. And so we've had both of these pieces for a while. But the glass was never in production, and so people were wondering, you know, are we going to get this glass piece? And finally, last year, we saw it in the Inside Tour set, um, and there's, I think there's 11 in the set. And people were getting excited because they're like, oh, now, we are, now we're probably going to see this glass in other LEGO sets and production sets. Really handy for, for buildings, for modulars. Um, you know, it, we have the frame, now we have the glass. Great. Not the case. Um, so far, this glass insert is still exclusive to the Inside Tour 2019 set. So, again, what can you do? It, it's all up to Lego. All right, so that's kind of that kind of wraps up um, my what I wanted to say for for production rare, and we want to move on to prototype rare. So, just kind of discuss here what is a prototype. Well, by definition, it's non-production, so it's supposed to some it's something that's supposed to stay in-house for developing new LEGO pieces, developing new colors, new molds. Um, we're looking at very limited runs, um, even though you know there's maybe a couple hundred produced, just to kind of spread these around and get them to different testers and different instruments. I think a lot of these end up broken eventually as they run you know strength tests. Um, but it's all internal, and so they have high collection value. These are the pieces that aren't supposed to find their way back out into the world, but sometimes factory employees can slip them into pockets, and they end up on the market. And so um, just kind of a couple of things you might have already seen that fall into this category. Um, these red test parts are really popular, and it is something you kind of have to be looking for, but I think... This is probably what most people have seen that is a prototype, is these test pieces. Um, and it's, it's Lego molds that we have in other colors, but we don't necessarily have in red. And so this ghost um, we have in white, I think we have in glow in the dark, but we haven't seen that in red in a production set. And that's what makes it a test element, that's what makes it a prototype. Um, another thing you might have seen are these marble 2x4s. And these are known as test bricks because I think most of these come from back in the 50s when Lego had sent out some of their molds to different chemical companies. And they were having them test um, new clutch, you know, stud diameters, slight variations on those, uh, and new plastics. And so this was when they were moving in away from the old brittle red that uh, you see in a lot of vintage pieces to the new ABS plastic that they're still using today. Um, but these companies that did these testing for Lego, they didn't really care about using uh, clean colors or keeping everything really uh, uniform. And so they would just put in random mixes of plastic, and that resulted in all of these marbled pieces. Uh, so of a majority of our marbled pieces are from this era of test bricks. I think there's still a few um, that end up, you know, when the Lego company changes the plastic in one of their current molds, I think we get these. And most of those end up recycled, but a few do slip out. So a test brick kind of sums up the the idea. This 2x4 marbled one kind of sums that all up nicely. And yeah, it'll run you 50 bucks for one of these, for a pretty one, uh, based on what I've seen. Couldn't tell you about the, the red prototypes. I don't know how much those are worth. So really briefly, before I talk about a lot of the prototype parts, I have to talk about the sets. And just a couple examples I have. It's hard to find examples for these because uh, a lot of it is in early publications, publicity material. These are 1998 Star, War, Star Wars prototype launch models and this box concept. And so these were produced for kind of uh, an inside look at the Star Wars line that was about to launch in 1999. Um, 
And so this snow speeder and this falcon didn't actually become official sets, but at some point they were assembled on a work table. Um, they were used in this box art. And we do see a couple of interesting pieces. The cockpit on the falcon, I don't know if we ever got that piece officially. And then if you look really close on the snow speeder, up on the nose area, there's this two by two greeble plate. Uh, and this was a concept part that never made it into official production, never made it into a set, but it still existed nonetheless. And so this opens up kind of this whole new door of prototype parts that, you know, fit into the Lego system really nicely, but they just never saw application. They never got used in official Lego sets. And so I've kind of collected a few of these. These are all posted by um, this guy on the right over here. It's, this is the profile picture for Walter Whiteside on Instagram. And he is a collector, as far as I can tell, of these prototype pieces. Um, so that's where these pictures are coming from. Uh, and what we see is kind of a few familiar shapes, like this corner. We have a 2x2 two two corner, but we don't have a 3x3 three three corner plate. And it's something that technically could be a Lego piece. And here we see that it is, but it just isn't used in any Lego sets. Our inverted two by four slope, that's kind of like the matching other half to our current two by four slope that goes the long way. But again, it just never saw production. Um, apparently this exists in reddish brown and, and purple at least, possibly more colors. It's really interesting one by four Technic brick with only three holes, uh, an inverted two by two slope with that the back section is open with some anti-studs in there. And then this other roof style that would look really handy in some modulars, I think, um, especially with these, um, these end caps, just never saw production, some two by two structure elements. And so these are all specifically Lego elements that never saw production they're still prototype parts, um, and specifically molds that never saw production, so prototype molds. And we do also have these prototype colors. Now this is a, just a Technic 2L pin. We have these in black, light gray, and um, that I think that's it right now. But these do exist in other colors. They've been molded in these colors for testing and prototypes, right? And so that's kind of where we see all these red pieces and the, the test parts for production. I think these are red because the red, I've heard the red shows the mold flaws. Um, but like we saw with the Technic pins, other colors exist. Um, but red kind of offers this opportunity to collectors to have this monochrome color scheme where if you are just collecting test pieces, a bunch of these are red. And so you end up with a really cool looking collection of all these red production pieces that weren't actually in production. Like this is our Batman, down on the bottom here, this is our Batman cowl, and we have loads of these in black. You know, there's probably 50 sets with this black Batman cowl. But no sets have it in red. It's a production uh, test piece. And so similar with the tree, uh, the Bubba Fett helmet, the cannon, all these pieces were supposed to stay within Lego factory development, and they found their way into the hands of collectors. Um, and this goes all the way back to, you know, Lego testing different mold grips and different stud types and that kind of thing. So with those collectors, with those curators, there's kind of three I want to mention where I've found a lot of these pictures, um, and I found these on Instagram and Flickr. And so these three main collectors that I follow are kind of the big players that at least have made things public for people to see what's in their collection. And these are Walter Whiteside, Math Cornelis, and Olaf Blankenfeld. Hope I'm saying all those right. Uh, Walter and Cornelis have pretty public collections on Flickr and Instagram. Um, Olaf has an Instagram, but he had said something about not wanting his pictures shared without asking. And so I haven't put any of his pictures on, but he does have some really cool stuff. So I recommend you check that out. All right, so now to kind of wrap up the discussion about rare Lego pieces, I have to mention the outliers that I mentioned earlier. And these are just collectible Lego, rare Lego, that doesn't fit into a production or our prototype categories. And so that starts with these mold errors. 
they're still collectible because they're sometimes they're like one of one, um, but it's kind of harder to place these in um, in the rankings of you know what makes something more rare. Um, and the, the pictures on the right here are some of the the common things that we see with either a short shot or a long shot. And so when you talk about plastic injection molding. A short shot is when you run out of plastic and so it doesn't fill the mold all the way. And so this clear blue two by two or two by four, well, first of all, we don't have this color in production. So that makes this kind of rare, uh, I think. And second of all, it's a short shot. And so the mold ran out of plastic. It's not, it wasn't broken after it was produced. It actually came out of the machine like that. Um, the other short shot here is this dark gray one by four where we actually, don't even have the remaining the like the last whole stud is completely missing it ran out of plastic and then on the right is this brown one by one and that's a long shot where there is too much plastic in the mold and it started spilling out and um, yeah, it kind of looks like chocolate so Samsonite was the producer for Lego in the US uh, in the 60s and they were notoriously worse with their quality control and so a lot of short shots that you might find are probably coming from the Samsonite, especially if they're older, because they, they just would slip through and make it into sets. Um, and like I said, these are harder to rank because depending on if you're actually interested in collecting these in the first place, um, and other people interested in collecting them, and then maybe a particular mold is more prone to short shots than other molds. And so you might have more two by fours with missing plastic than one by ones, hard to say. Um, the other outlier is a misprint. And so the two examples here are this guy with the sunglasses and Chewbacca. Um, the sunglasses one's pretty obvious. It's missing a whole, that whole uh, frame. It just didn't get printed in silver. Um, but then Chewbacca, if you look closely, it's actually printed on the reverse of the Chewbacca head mold. And these, are just pieces that slipped through quality control at Lego, made it into a set, and if they didn't get tossed then um, thrown away, people are interested in collecting these. They have some value. And I think the more severe you look at this, the more rare it is, because if it's more severe, it's more likely to be caught before it exits the factory. Um, another thing in this uh, kind of in this topic would be sticker mishaps. And so what we just saw with our, our A-Wing, Ultimate Collector Series A-Wing, was kind of some misinformation um, on the actual sticker. And I think that's something LEGO will change in subsequent production runs. But that sticker itself now in this first run of A-Wings is maybe collectible because it has this, um, this misinformation. And I'll put a link in to the Brickset article about that. It's, it kind of gets a little bit... Um, niche in terms of how far you actually want to pursue that. A couple other outliers are Legoland display models and publicity models. And so this picture of Ray from Legoland Florida, if you look close, most of Ray's outfit is a dark tan, tan, and gray. And so if you compare that tan to Ray's face and hands, you can see that the, the face and the hands are actually the same color that LEGO uses for their Star Wars minifigures, which is called Flesh. It's a flesh color. And um, Flesh is not produced in LEGO bricks. It's only produced for minifigure pieces in official sets. But um, the model builders at Legoland get to use this color in bricks for building their models. And so it does get produced. It's just not something for, for public official sets. It's something that's supposed to stay within the park um, and stay within you know, the Lego publicity stuff. And so that kind of makes it rare. Um, I think it's worth mentioning here. The other thing is publicity models like the Bugatti. The Technic Bugatti has all of these Technic pieces and I'm not sure if these clear beams are non-production, but I know that uh, it, it did have a few pieces that are not officially produced. And so LEGO will make these pieces so that they can make these publicity models happen, but it's more of like a one-for-one one one situation where this is not going to be something that they do again. It's a very limited run just to make this happen for their publicity stuff. It looks really cool. Um, so yeah, kind of moving along here, 
we have to look at a few more things when we're talking about Rare Lego, and that's the super rare collectible stuff. Lego actually caters to collectors in terms of making things that are one for one, um, one for two. And one, one example here is the Bubba Fett Holy Trinity. This is a 2010 Celebration 5 collectible edition. Uh, it's framed, completely encased. It has a one of two 14 karat gold Bubba Fett, a one of two sterling silver, and then a one of 10,000 white Bubba Fett. And there's actually something on the VIP site right now with more um, of these white test Bubba Fetts. But this particular three for three collection piece, it was specifically designed for the collector in mind. And it has a collector price tag. It's $20,000. I think it's might maybe changed hands once or twice. And so we have kind of, kind of an idea of where to put the value on this, but um, similar pieces that haven't really changed hands at all, it's really hard to say what those are worth. So yeah, another thing would be like our, our 14 karat gold C3PO minifigure, the bronze Bubba Fett. Um, there's actually quite a few of these out there, and these have been specifically designed with the collector in mind, so intentionally produced to be rare. Something you guys might not have seen or heard of before uh, is what I call the ultra rare. The NASA Juno minifigs were produced to go on the Juno probe that's out studying Jupiter. These are made out of space grade aluminum, so you know, really pressing the boundaries here on what's actually a Lego minifigure. Obviously recognizable, but not even made of the same material. And these guys aren't even on Earth right now. Um, so in terms of you know, actually someone collecting these, it raised a couple questions. Um, and next year, July 30th, they're actually going to crash the probe into Jupiter. And so these guys are going to end up destroyed, right? Um, a, they're not on Earth. B, we're not going to be able to get them back even if we could go out to get them. But there are rumors of a second copy of the ultra-rare Juno minifigs. Um, even just to produce these out of that space grade aluminum, it was estimated about $5,000. All these sources are in the last, um, the last couple of slides, but you know, you really have to speculate on what does the, what, what is the price tag for collecting the second copy is rumored to exist. It could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it really brings us back to the question, what is rare, right? So how many examples exist? In this case, one, you know, three unique minifigures, one of each, technically two, but one of them's not accessible. How old is it? Well, this one's relatively recent, and who has it? Well, the ones in space, no one has. Um, the, one, the second copy, rumored, you know, who has that? We don't know, where could it be? And so at some point you just have to say, what rare Lego is, is this thing, and it's also this thing, but we have to differentiate, right? We have to look at the accessible rare Lego. And so there's maybe some things that really push the boundary on what is collectible and what is rare. And so I do have a few things that I, uh, I'm happy to have, um, and just mention those quickly here. But this one by one round piece with the hollow stud is pretty well known. Um, between 1963 and 1982, these were produced with a solid stud that had the logo on there. Um, and they were produced in 11 different colors. I've got four. Um, I do not have the rarest of these, which is a clear yellow. And the clear yellow one by one with the solid stud was only found in two sets, 1978 and 1979. But they're harder to find, um, specifically in this case because they're older. and. I ended up with these just by buying a bunch of mixed lots. Uh, I did buy a couple older lots specifically just to have kind of a mix of older pieces in my collection. And um, they're, they're still out there. They're kind of mixed in now, but you can still find them. Uh, I do have a short shot that I'm pretty happy with. It is a two by two macaroni brick. And the one on the left is the uh, modern production, what it's supposed to look like. The one on the right is my short shot, and you can see it's kind of got that groove, and then it actually has another hollow space up underneath the stud. Pretty sure this was a Samsonite piece. Um, it ticks all the boxes for that. I also have this 2x2 two two slope, 
And what makes this piece special is the, um, the two different logos. And so the logo on the right, I think was the older um, italic logo that they used uh, up to 68. And then the logo on the left was the new Samsonite balloon letter logo. And then they changed it again in the 70s to the, the standard one that we have now. But kind of in that, that combination period when they were using both, it was a possibility that they could end up with both different logos in the, in the same molding machine. And that's what happened here, obviously. Um, the question is, it's difficult to say like how rare this piece is because eventually it would have been caught by quality control at Samsonite. And it's also pretty old. It dates back to the 70s, 60s. And so a lot of these are could be missing now. Um, so nothing particularly rare or valuable, but it it is a unique piece. And um, yeah, I, I actually found this in um, in Des Moines at the JCD and Hobby Store just on the brick wall. Um, they must have bought an older lot from someone in town and it got mixed in to the pick a brick wall and I picked it up without even realizing what I had. And was looking through later and like, oh, that's pretty cool. So to sum all of this up, I have created what I call the Lego Ladder of Rare. And uh, I have made an attempt to kind of rank the different topics that have been discussed. Um, this isn't anything really definitive, but I think it's a place to start. And so if at the top of the Lego Ladder of Rare are the one of one, the Juno minifigs, there's no way, I, I don't think we're gonna ever see something that beats that in terms of Rare Lego. But again, that's really pushing the boundary on what collectible rare Lego looks like, so yeah, questionable to put that up there, but below that are some of the collector's edition, and just in terms, ranking things in terms of value, $20,000 is a lot of money for a picture frame, so keep that in mind. Um, concept parts that have very limited production, they're only in a couple of collector's hands right now, it makes them really rare, they're not necessarily valuable because you have to have a market and there's not a huge market for concept parts. Um, test parts maybe have a little bigger market, more people know about that maybe, and there are also a few more of those produced per piece, I think. Special models uh, like the Bugatti, like the Ray that use those um, non-production pieces. Factory errors coming in with uh, the overshots, um, the short shots, um, that kind of thing, where those actually do end up in in the marketplace um, and you could end up with those by accident. Uh, retired molds and colors and production parts kind of ranking down there at the bottom. And what we have is kind of a division here where if you're really looking for some of this stuff towards the top, you have to put in more effort, high effort hunting for some of these pieces. You have to actually be looking for these to find them. It's not just gonna fall in your lap. Uh, whereas on the bottom, you might encounter these by chance, especially if you're buying bulk lots of Lego. Um, and very rarely you could see maybe some of these test parts in bulk lots, but I don't think that happens a lot. You're much more likely to find these rare production pieces in bulk lots. People just don't know what they have sometimes. And so you end up with older pieces, short shots, over shots, um, maybe even the Bubba Fett minifigure. So eventually, if you are buying a lot of Lego, it, statistically you could end up with this stuff. Um, I'm not sure how many, like, you know, every thousand pieces are you going to find something interesting. I don't want to put numbers on it, but just keep that in mind, especially when you're buying secondhand that's all mixed together. You don't really know, like, you don't really know what's there. You just have to, to buy it and see. So do, good luck, guys, um, with your hunting, treasure hunting. Mr. Gold here wishes you luck, uh, whatever you're looking to find. I know it's been a lot of fun to collect and see what I can find just on the secondary market in my eBay bulk lots and even looking at specifically some vintage stuff sometimes to find that harder to find stuff. But um, the rare Lego is out there and depending on what you're looking for, can be had for a price, but hopefully this is a place to start and just remember like, couple main categories to look through are the production rare, 
and the prototype rear. And so when someone's talking about rear Lego, you can ask them, well, what do you mean? Is it production rear? Is it prototype rear? And if they haven't heard of prototype rear, you know, I think that's pretty cool stuff. You introduce them to it and, and see, you know, maybe kick off a collection of your own. But yeah, those curators on Instagram and Flickr, check them out. They post pretty regularly, really interesting stuff there. Mini figures, uh, prototype parts, all that good stuff. All right, guys, thanks for watching my video about Rare Lego. Um, Brick System Brothers, we do everything Lego videos. We've got over 150 on our channel now, um, so go check those out. It's been a lot of fun to, to do the research and to look through, um, and I've learned a lot making this. So thanks for watching. I'll see you guys around.